there are two types of batteries or IPGs available. There are the non-rechargeable types or the rechargeable types. The non-rechargeable types have been around for many years and traditionally they've been used for spinal cord stimulation. In recent years we've had access to newer technology in the form of rechargeable devices. The advantage of these devices is that you don't need to replace the batteries as often as you did before. Typically these rechargeable batteries can last 9 or 10 years or even longer. The downside to having a rechargeable battery is the time that needs to be invested by the patient in recharging the battery. Recharging can be done while you're watching the TV, driving your car or sitting on the couch reading a book. It may need to be done every few days or every few weeks depending on the voltage requirements for your particular problem. Recharging the battery is fairly easy but it's critical that this is done on a regular basis. It can be done watching television, reading a book or even driving your car. How often you need to recharge your battery will depend upon how much current or voltage you're using to treat your condition. Decisions about whether to use percutaneous type electrodes or paddle type electrodes, whether to use a rechargeable device or a non-rechargeable device need to be made before your surgery. This requires discussion with your specialist and you need to be happy with the final decision and this needs to be an informed decision. The advantages of spinal cord stimulation are that it's a minimally invasive, reversible, non-destructive, relatively low risk procedure. Like any surgical procedure, it does however carry a small risk of complications. These complications can include bleeding, infection, migration or movement of the electrode and other more rare complications. Minor complications can occur relatively frequently, however fortunately major complications such as paralysis or even death are extremely rare. The chance of having a complication depends upon a number of factors, some of which are going to be unique to the patient and some of which may be related to the technique as well. Some patients are at higher risk of complications than others. For example, patients with diabetes, bleeding problems or other significant medical problems will certainly be in the higher rather than the lower risk group. Before having your surgery, it's important to select a specialist with a great deal of experience and expertise in this technique. You need to ask them how many of these have they done, how often do they do them, what their complication rates are. You need to be comfortable with the person who's operating on your spine. Spinal cord stimulation is different to many other types of surgery. It represents a partnership between you, your specialist and your device. It represents the start of a journey along the path of improved quality of life and improved pain control. To get the most out of your spinal cord stimulation procedure, you'll need to maintain a long-term relationship with your multidisciplinary team. You'll need to have programming from time to time over the course of many years. You may need to have ongoing physiotherapy. You may need to keep seeing your pain specialist and also be taking some pain medications. Spinal cord stimulation is not a standalone solution or cure for your pain, but rather one important component of your overall treatment. Chronic pain due to nerve injuries or complex regional pain syndrome is often amenable to spinal cord stimulation. If you suffer from chronic pain, ask your GP or your pain specialist for a referral to an expert in spinal cord stimulation to see whether this is something that might be of help to you.